Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, this is the first time that I've actually used a microphone here. Usually, I'm just very loud. So um, forgive me if I do sound very loud. I, I project a lot. Um, I have a four-year-old, so you know that I'm always like, stop. So I will try to um, do the best I can with the volume. Sounds OK? Everybody can hear me? Great. Um, well, thank you for coming out to Tree of Life. This is such a great place. As Kevin said, um, I did used to work here. I loved it desperately. It was great. Um, before that, I did. Um, I worked for an environmental consulting firm, and I did bird surveys, wildlife biology. So I really uh, spent a lot of time out in the field with my trusty binos. I saw a few of you guys had some, right? A few of you had some? Great. Well, once we burn through these photos and slides, we'll go wander around and see what we can find. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about gardening for birds using native plants. Um, so are you guys all pretty local to Orange County? Hands, everybody here at Orange County? Do we have anybody over the hill? All right, Riverside area? Temecula. Temecula, great, okay. Well, we got plants for you too. Um, so the idea is if you build it, they will come. And this can happen, uh, you know, you can, it, create and design your garden and your landscape that will entice our feathered friends, as well as other wildlife. The basic things that you basically want for them is the necessities. You want food, you want shelter, and they want water. So encouraging birds to your garden oasis, you want to have food for them. And this is the source of a lot of the food here at the nursery. You want to cut, get the right plants for the right type of birds. So a lot of them will be seed eaters, they can be um, fruit eaters, insect eaters, uh, nectar, or hummingbirds, of course. Um, another thing to kind of consider, too, is since a lot of them are insect eaters, I want to be careful and thoughtful about if you're going to put some insecticide on your plants. I know we all love our roses. My dad is always saying, like, you, there's, there's bugs on it. He has this one rose, and I said, well, you know, just wait, see what happens. And without fail, we'll always have something come by and take care of it. So kind of following in that balance in your garden and, and knowing that you're gonna have some insects, that's okay. I mean, it's, it's the natural food web to have that. And if you don't have any insects, then you're cutting out a whole area of birds, type of birds that won't be coming to your garden so much because you don't have the food source. So thinking about that, um, we're going to dive into what types of plants, native plants, you can put in your garden to entice each type of these types of birds. Uh, one thing, I was talking to Jeffrey about this earlier this morning a little bit, is so some of these birds are typically going to be like seed eaters, let's say our finches, for example. But you might see them start gleaning, start taking some caterpillars or some aphids, and, and you think, well, why? Because they're feeding their young. And young, birds will need more protein in order to grow. So that actually there's a lot of them will be generalists in the springtime, typically only in the springtime. But um, they'll be taking more insects off to, in order to feed their young. Um, water. Water is another huge thing for birds. Actually, for almost all living things, right? <laughs> we, we all want water. We all love water. And the sound of a fountain or a water feature really will entice those birds in. They can hear from a long distance. You think their main form of communication is sound, right? They're calling, so they have acute hearing. And they can hear this trickling effect of this water feature if you put them in your, in your garden. You can have a bird bath, too, which is great for them. They love to take showers and baths, and, and, um, but also the trickling effect, they want to drink the water as well. Um, here's just some fun things to consider about if you do put a water feature in. Um, Got to think about the height a little bit. So um, I think typically you will see um, those you know, standard pedestal bird baths up a little higher out in the middle of nowhere, like it's grass all around and there's, ta-da, here's my bird bath. Um, it looks great, I guess, in some ways, but probably not ideal for a lot of birds. For a, for a number of reasons. One, it's probably too high, because most, if you think about all natural features, are typically on the ground, right? If we have some water, you get a little rain event, it's gonna be cooling on the bottom, on the ground. So that pedestal one is gonna be high. 
It's also going to be out maybe in the middle of your lawn. Well, here at Tree of Life, we say, let's try other things besides the lawn. So let's just say you have one. Um, that is wide open for predators. That's wide open for, for everything for them. And it's be a little scary. You know, it's like kind of like me standing up in front of all of you guys right now, right? <laughs> like, I feel very wide and open here. Uh, so you want to have, if you do have a pedestal or you do have something that's a little bit higher, you want to think about having some cover for them. You know, so they can, if they see a hawk fly by or if they have a cat or something, they can dive into those trees and protect themselves for cover. So this, these are some things to consider. Um, the depth of it, too. We don't want to drown our birds. I mean, typically they can, <laughs> can get themselves out of it, but you usually want to have it about, you know, an inch or two deep, just enough so they can put their feet down and clean themselves off. Um, I talked a little bit about the sound. They have great acute hearing. Um, and then keeping it clean. You know, um, often, sometimes, you know, we'll neglect our garden every once in a while, and then you see that, oh, that bird bath, oh, there's all those leaves in it, oh. I, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to go bathing in a scum-filled little pool. They don't really want to either. So cleaning that ev out every once in a while is um, a great idea. Um, other ways to encourage the birds to your garden <clears throat> is shelter. Talked a little bit about that with the... Um, where if you're going to put a water feature. Having a diversity of heights and structure is highly desirable for a variety of birds. Um, so they're going to be hiding in there for predators. They're going to be finding food. They're going to be finding shelter if it's hot or if it's cold. You want to have that variety. If you just have a lawn, a grass lawn, or just one layer of shrubs, that's really going to limit the amount of, of species that will come there and also the, the ability for them to hide. Um, so this image, the one on the left, is actually, um, I'm an arborist, and it's from one of the arborist guides. And I just want to point out a few things. Is This is considered a high-value habitat. Um, both of them are considered high value habitat. And one of them is because they have the mosaic. They have the tall trees, they have the big shrubs, they have the lower shrubs, they have some open ground. Uh, there's even great things for birds too, and people don't often think about this, is a dead tree. And often people are like, get that dead tree out of here. But that's a great nesting opportunity for cavity nesters. Also, you know, you get some owls, you can get um, woodpeckers, you can get kestrels. I think there's a ton of woodpeckers in this tree right behind us, and we'll be hearing them, I'm sure, serenading us throughout this entire talk. Um, so you're really thinking about this kind of diversity, not just one type of thing, not one type of, of structure. Um, the picture on the right is from Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Um, you can see the tall trees in the back, flowering, open, also open space, right? You want to have a little bit of open ground because there's a lot of birds that like to go and dig in the ground a little bit. You'll see the towhees. You guys will talk about towhees a little bit. I'm sure we'll see one pop by here soon. Um, but they will go and they will rummage through the leaf litter looking for little things to eat, seeds and grubs. So you like that it's good to have that kind of open ground for them. Um, you can build bird condos. This is just a fun little image. Um, I hope you guys can see it, but it's just that kind of fun. Um, I don't know if it's utilized, but it sure is some fun art. But, you know, birds that will use those would be your wrens. Wrens love those cavity nesters. Again, we were talking, I was talking about, you know, dead or dying trees. They have those cavities. That's great for wrens. That's great for bluebirds. Um, so, things to consider. So, when... When you guys are in your backyard, let me ask you this, let me back up for a second. How many of you in the last two years were home at eight or nine o'clock in the morning and was like, oh, I'm home at eight or nine o'clock in the morning and oh my gosh, there's a lot of birds in my backyard. Is anybody? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Oh, look at my little <laughs> black feeties. Oh, they're nesting. Oh, because I, mean, I was home. I was able, I wasn't at work. I was working from home. So I think I don't know, but I, I feel like there's a lot more um, birders now out there because now we're seeing this beautiful thing that in our environment that we maybe haven't been able to see so much because we've been so busy going to work. And I hope that you guys, I hope that's the case because 
birding is really fun and a challenge and, um, and a great way to meet really cool people. And so one way um, to observe the birds. So we're gonna go step back a little bit. I feel like some of you guys are already pretty good birders and have the binos, but this is gonna be your basics. You know, like if you're just starting birding. So what are you gonna think about? Where did you see it? Um, oh, I guess it transferred over, it got a little weird. So uh, one thing to think about is like wh where you saw it is, it, is it up high? Is it on the ground? Um, was it flying? Was it hopping? Was it perching? What size was it? Was it bigger or smaller than a robin? Everybody knows what a robin, uh, robin size is? Pretty general, you know. We have some little birds that are like this big. And then we have other birds that are, you know, turkey vultures. What color was it? Um, did it have patches of color somewhere? That's really important for key of identifying, identifying these birds. Is, does it have a splash of yellow somewhere? Is the tail, one side of the tail, a different color? These are all things that when you're sitting in your house or in your backyard observing the beautiful garden that you've created for them, how you're going to identify them. Um, if it had splashes of different colors, where? Was it on its chest? Was it on its back? Was it um, on its tail? Was it on its head? And these are all, all these kind of mental notes, or you can even do physical notes if you want, that you should kind of be running through your head as you, you're seeing this map. Mind you, it's probably all in a matter of like 0.3 seconds as it flies by you, but you're trying to take as much information in as you can. Was there any distinguishing markings? Did it have a, um, an eye ring or a mask? Did it have a long tail? Was it, was it tail scissored? Um, I jumped ahead. And the stripes are different colors. And um, what were the flight characteristics? So you can actually identify a lot of different types of birds just by their flight characteristics. Uh, and it's one thing which is very distinctive of warblers, which we'll talk a little about, which are, tend to be more migratory birds, but they tend to glean and hover over a, a shrub. So they'll, almost like a kite, they'll, they'll say this is a shrub right here, they'll swoop in and they'll flutter right here, and they'll dive in, and they'll come back, and they'll flutter right here. So that's a, a very warbler characteristic. So you can always see that habit and be like, that's a warbler. I can't tell what it is. It's a little BB, a little brown bird, but it's a warbler. Um, and then what does the beak look like? So that's really important because that then tends to lead you to what type of food it eats. So if you think about the beak, is it, is it hooked? Is it long and hooked? Is it sharp like a, like a raptor? Or is it short and stubby? Is it long and thin? like a hummingbird for nectar. So here's some little ideas of how you can kind of identify what they are. Um, again, like I said, the short and fine bill, usually an insect eater, right? Because they need to go in there and, and get that insect real quick and out. If it's um, a thick bill, usually that's for um, seeds because they have to crush those seeds, almost like, like a parrot, right? Parrots have those really thick bills because they got to crush all that food. Um, is it hooked or sharp, and that's, you know, for your carnivore eaters, they have to, they're ripping up the meat. Um, is it long and skinny for nectar, like a hummingbird? So I understand that when you're, sometimes when you're birding, all you're seeing is like this little flash of something, or you're, you've got your binos out and you're ready and it's moving and you're like, where did it go? You know, and you're moving around. So sometimes you can't always get all the identifying features out. But if you can, if you can get a few of them, then you can start to identify, well, okay, it, it had this short little beak, it was kind of hovering, I bet that might be a warbler, you know, I bet that might be, or it could be another one where it um, has a really stout beak, oh, maybe, it, maybe it's a gross beak, so you can kind of start honing in on what you have out there, and then you can figure out what you can plant to bring more of them in. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the common birds that you might have in your garden and how you can bring them to your garden. Mind you, there is so many birds out there. I mean, there, there's books. <laughs> there's so many books. And I feel like most of you guys probably know a fair amount of them, so I'm just going to go over a few of them, very general ones, and then you can kind of um, expand that. But general characteristics that will help you um, identify the birds and, um, and then what you can do to bring them into your garden. So for our seed eaters, you know, we talked a little bit about that beak with the seed eaters. 
we, we all have house finches. I think no matter where you are, you have a house finch. You can be in an apartment complex and be on the 30th floor and all of a sudden there's a house finch on your railing. They're everywhere. They're ubiquitous in this area. But you got to love them, right? They've, in, the, in the time of breeding, the males will become, have, can be very red or orange on their chest. And you can see this guy right here. He's calling out. He's like, hey, baby, look at me over here. And um, they become very colorful with that red. And then with the tan, uh, the tan and brown rest of the body, the females tend to be just more brown, very um, subdued because they're nesting. Um, they have that short, stubby beak because they're seed eaters. And um, they're very social. So you tend to see, if you see one, wait, wait a few minutes. <laughs> it's going to have some friends. They're going to be there. They're going to be bouncing all over. Um, you will often find them kind of hopping around on the ground. You don't tend to see them very often perched high in trees. They're usually going to be lower on the ground, lower shrubs, because um, they're going for like seeds from the encelia or from um, salvias. They um, will eat insects every once in a while if they have babies, but they tend to just go for seeds and small fruits and berries and leaf buds which sometimes is a little frustrating when you have a brand new, beautiful Ribes arium and they're over there and they're eating all the little new leaves. But I created that garden for them, so I guess it's doing the right job. <laughs> um, so lesser goldfinch, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, it's just, they're just so fun to watch when you get them in the garden, because it's not usually one. It's like a whole flock of them and they just come bounding into your yard um, and they're so social and they just chatterbox all the time. They're just talking all the time. Do, 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 do. I think it sounds like a ricocheting bullet when they're talking. So I can always, and that's how I associate it. And so whenever I hear that, I'm like, oh, there's a goldfinch. And then, oh, there they are. Um, they are one of those yellow birds. We have a few yellow birds here that, that makes it really easy to identify it because yellow is really easy to pick out. And it's, a green background, you know, that's a bright yellow bird right there. Um, they have a whole dark hat, cap right here, so that makes it really easy to identify them. Um, and they, they're around for most of the year. Um, you'll start seeing them a lot more in summer. Spring, summer is when they're like most active. That's when most of the seeds are developing. So you'll start seeing the big flocks coming in. Um, I tend to see the most of them usually around May, June, and that kind of that coincides with our encelia, the California sunflower, is going to seed. And that's this guy right here. And I um, speak real loud. So this is the dried out flower right here that was on this plant. These guys, they love these guys. And so you'll get five, ten of them on a shrub, and they're all, and they're picking at this and they're getting these seeds. And um, so that's kind of fun to watch them. And so usually, you know, late, very late spring, early summer is when you'll start seeing a lot of them. So the American goldfinch is very similar to the lesser goldfinch. Um, they're cousins. They look very, very similar. We tend to see more lesser goldfinch in this area than the American goldfinch. Um, the American goldfinch tends to have more yellow on its body. Um, and in the, on the males, it's only right on their forehead is where they have the black, as opposed to like the whole head being almost all black. Also found in big groups, they do the same idea. They will find a shrub, and then there will be like six to ten of them all taking all the seeds off of them. Um, they also have the ricocheting sound bullet, just like um, the other one, but we tend to see more of these guys um, not, excuse me, we don't see these as much as we see the lesser. Um, so some of the wonderful plants that you will attract these goldfinches and other types of finches. I mean, there's, if you were to look at the Silby's book over there, there's probably dozens of finches that, that are out there. I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Um, but generally, they're all seed eaters, so they're all going to like these types of plants. They're all going to love your salvias, your sages. Um, in that photo from before, you could see that one of them was taking the seed out of the, uh, of the sage. 
the California bush sunflower. That's this guy right over here that I talked a little bit about them taking the seeds out. Um, grasses, our native grasses, are so underutilized in the landscapes that um, kind of breaks my heart a little bit. And they are really quite wonderful for a number of, of um, birds, not only for the seed, because they'll take the seed off, but it's great nesting material, right? It's, it's grades of black grass, but it's almost like string, you know, so that's, they'll utilize that for nesting. Um, monkey flower is another one, because monkey flower has a nice thick seed that's big, um, and buckwheat. Uh, there's this buckwheat right here, which is one of my favorites, the sulfur buckwheat. Um, and they have great seeds that a lot of the finches will like. All right, so I talked a little bit before about tohis. This is the spotted tohi. The spotted tohi you tend to find more in kind of like a little bit more wooded areas, not necessarily um, in downtown Irvine area because it's a little bit too built up. But... Um, but they tend to be more in the kind of chaparral areas and, and housing developments that might be out in, let's say, Rancho Santa Margarita area or um, Santiago Canyon or maybe in uh, Brea. Um, actually, probably out in Temecula. You have them out in Temecula as well. I mean, we have them all over, but they tend to be m more prevalent in areas that have a little bit more densely wooded areas. Um, they're really fun because they have these great red eyes. I think it's fun. Could be creepy to some, to others, but I think it's kind of neat. Um, and they are insect and seed eaters, and you will see them, much like their cousin, the California tohi, they will be on the ground. You know, this is a great description right over here with this oak, and you can see all the oak leaf litter down there. They'll be bouncing in there and, and scuffling up to see what they can find in there. And you tend to find them um, kind of on the lower end, the lower third of of shrubs and trees. They don't get really high up in the branches. They're going to stay kind of low. Um, they are pretty distinctive. We don't have a whole lot of birds that look like this with red eyes, um, a white chest, I call it a cinnamon color, and black striped back. Um, and they have a really fun call too, which kind of sounds like a raspberry to me. Um, but they, you'll see those. One you'll see probably the most of is the California tohi. You guys have all seen this guy, right? I think so, he's everywhere. And they're so fun. Um, and I, I keep looking over here because I feel like I know I'm gonna see one sooner or later. Um, maybe I'm talking too loud and I'm scaring them off. Uh, we're in the bird bubble. You guys know all about the bird bubble, right? When you're out with your binoculars and you're trying to find a bird and they're all gone and you had just seen them right there and as soon as you pull up your binos, it's like they all just disappear. <laughs> They know you're in the bird bubble. Um, so one key characteristic for the tohi is that it's going to have this kind of orange thing on right underneath its tail on its rump. On its rump. Um, you, if you see that, you're like, oh, that's, a, that's a tohi. That's California tohi. Um, so you will always see them in the leaf litter. Again, they don't get very tall, high up in trees. They stay low. They like the leaf litter. They like the real dense bushes, too, because they can get underneath it, and they're safe to go scurrying and looking in the leaf litter. So you'll often find them deep inside the bushes, big bushes like a lemonade berry or a um, sugar bush. They love those and they'll get right in underneath them. Uh, but they have adapted to urban life. I've seen them in Irvine. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen them in San Clemente. So they, they make their way around. So they're, they're fun. Um, so we talked a little bit about this. Is they, they like dense cover. Um, because they're on the ground, they're very vulnerable. So they like to have some dense cover around them. So some great plants for that um, would be your coast live oak, ones that also create a lot of leaf litter, which is really great for your soil. I know there's a lot of people who think, oh no, the leaves are falling down, I gotta rake them up. I don't know what, I, I guess it's because if you have a lawn, right? If you have a lawn, then you wanna rake up those leaves. But if you have a natural garden, you really wanna leave those leaves for so many reasons. One, you have more time on your Saturday, right? <laughs> Two, like it breaks down, and it's adding organic matter into your soil, which is really great since we have, sometimes we have some really depleted soils, especially if you live in a master plan community where you, at, even if it was built in the 80s, they built that home, they scraped all that nutrient soil off when they built your home. 
So it's taken a long time for that nutrients to come back. So leave that leaf litter there. And then you might get towhees because they love to dig in there. And um, you can get great insects in there and the, the mycorrhizae and all the, the microorganisms that are breaking that down is so beneficial. So um, I hope you get a lot of things out of this talk. But I also hope that you think about leaving some of that leaf litter of your oaks and your sycamores if you have them. Um, probably not eucalyptus because they have alleliopathies and they have oils in the leaves that don't break down very readily. But your native plants, if you leave those leaf litters, that's actually a really great thing. Um, lemonade berry, again, uh, dense. They like the denseness. Um, sugar bush, same idea. Manzanitas, um, coyote bush, sages, and buckwheats. Um, these are all you know, fairly dense plants um, that have leaf litter and that they can kind of get in and underneath. Um, this is an, another seed eating is our morning dove. Um, my friend was telling me a little while ago that there is a, um, I think she called it a trigger bird. It was a talk on This American Life. And I guess all birders have trigger birds. And uh, I never thought about it. And so she asked me, what's your trigger bird? And I was like, oh gosh, I, I don't know. And maybe it was a California gnat catcher because I did a bunch of California gnat catcher surveys. And then I started thinking about it, and it goes back to the morning dove. When I was a kid, we used to have morning doves, and my dad would call them. I have this now, so I can't do it. But we would call them, and they would um, be in our, in our backyard. And, that's what, and then we had the binos so we could watch them. You know, and then he'd do it, and they'd, he'd say something mean, and they'd all fly off. And we didn't know what it was, but it was always entertaining. So um, oddly enough, the morning dove is my trigger bird. And um, so I have a... It, it, it holds a piece of my heart. It also is not the cleverest of birds. Um, you gotta love them, but they're so funny. Like they will nest anywhere. I, it's like I don't know. It's like they have no sense of time, and they're like, "What? Oh, I gotta lay an egg. Here's three sticks on the ground, and <laughs> done." And you're like, "What? The, how are there so many doves? I still haven't figured that out. I still have not figured out how there are so many doves when they nest in the most precarious places. I've seen one." tried to nest on a palm frond that was, had fallen over, and they put, I'm not exaggerating, four sticks. I had put four sticks down, and it was sitting on it. I said, and I was doing a nesting bird survey. I'm like, does that constitute, a, is that a nest? Is that, <laughs> is it going to survive? But it was doing nesting behavior, so I marked it on my map and said, we've got a, a nesting dove here. I don't know if we'll survive. But they are, they're fun. They're you know, these big plump birds that come into your garden and they, um, and they sound beautiful when they fly in, which is always fun. Um, we do have some non-native doves, um, the collared Eurasian doves, and you'll see them. Um, there's one that is called a lace neck, and around its neck, it, it's really, it's quite beautiful, but it has white, looks like lace, white spots all around it. And then there's another one, the collared one, that just has a black bar, and they're quite plump. Um, they're bigger than our native morning dove. And uh, let's see if I can do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can do a treat for you guys. I'm going to do the call. Here we go. All right, see if I can do it. This is on camera, though, so now, now it's going to work. Not going to work at all. That's kind of what it sounds like. Um, yeah. <laughs> Can't do cross buns, heart cross buns, but, um, but you can do that. It's really fun. Um, and try to call them into your yard and um, see if they like it or not. Sometimes they come and check it out. They call back, which is kind of fun. And sometimes you say something that maybe was not so nice and they go, prrr, maybe fly off. Uh, they are seed eaters. Uh, you will often see them when people have bird feeders. They love those bird feeders. And they're so big, too, that when they, you know, those pendulum bird feeders, and they get on, and you, have you seen the bird feeders, that they swing? Because they can't, I mean, birds are very lightweight, but for some reason, these guys it's got some chunk to them. Um, so that's our morning doves. So we're going to talk a little bit about our berry eaters and our generalist eaters. They don't eat cornucopias. I was just putting that out there just because they will eat whatever they can out there. Um, so our mockingbirds, 
Uh, we all have mockingbirds out. They are great adapters to the urban lifestyle. And, um, and this is out of order a little bit. My apology for that. Um, but they, mockingbirds tend to like, again, dense cover and berries and fruit. And you'll see them um, eating the toyon berries, the manzanita berries, um, wild grape. They really like to get into the wild grape. Um, they like the lilac, the California Lysianothus. And here's our friend, the mockingbird, right here. And they're everywhere, and they're great. They, they will trick me sometimes. One time I was doing a, a California gnat catcher bird survey, and um, God, I kept hearing this gnat catcher in an area that it should not be, and it was really bugging me. And I was like, where is it? And then, and the Sambucus is this little stinker, <laughs> this mockingbird, just calling, meow, meow, meow. I was like, oh, I don't have a gnat catcher here. I have a mockingbird. Um, so they're mimics. They're in the catbird family. Um, so they'll mimic other birds. I've heard one sound like a frog. Um, and that's kind of fun. And, and then they change their mind. They're very schizophrenic in a sense. They're like, I'm going to be a goldfinch now. And they'll pew, pew, pew. Oh, now I'm going to be a thrasher. Rawr, rawr, rawr. And they'll just go through these calls after calls after calls. And these are the ones that you hear at night. Have you heard of the night birds where you're trying to go to sleep? And then there's like this one male mockingbird who just won't, be, won't stop. And he's calling and he's calling. It's like, the bars are closed, buddy. Go home. You know, but he's still out there. Hello, hello. Um, so those are the birds that you hear at night in the summertime, usually calling. Um, they have, they're very distinctive when you see them, they're gray. We don't have a whole lot of birds that are this big that, will, that look like this, with these white bands on their, and patches on their wings when they fly. Um, they can be all over the tree. They'll be on the ground, they'll be in the middle, they'll be on the top. You won't see them like necessarily on the top of like an oak or sycamore, but you'll see them on the top of a, an, an elderberry because it's fruit and they're eating it and they're saying, this is my home. Um, they, if, if you think you have a nest, a mockingbird nest in your, your yard, good on you, because it's really hard to find a mockingbird nest. They are really good at hiding their nests and then if they know that you're watching them, they'll go to other areas and they'll take sticks and twigs and go to another area like, oh no, I'm, my nest is over here now. And, and they'll trick you, and they'll do these fake nests around to try to lure you away from their home. So um, finding a mockingbird nest is really, really fun. I was doing a survey one time, and I had a map, and I knew it was there, and I looked in that dang oak tree for like a good 30 minutes, and I was like, I cannot find this nest. Like, someone must have marked this wrong. This, there's no not mockingbird here. And it was like 10 feet away from me, and it was not moving. That bird was hunkered down, in this cavity area, they're very superb camouflage nesters. So um, that's always really fun to see when they have a nest. And they'll dive into a bush and, um, and dive out. And you're like, I know there's a nest in there. Well, no, <laughs> it's very hard to find. So if you do find them, gold star. Um, these are one of my, another one of my favorites, the hooded orioles. Um, they migrate in and they are so chatty and so fun. Um, we have two Orioles. We have the, um, the hooded Oriole, this one, and then also the Bullock's Oriole. I just put this one in because for the sake of time, I feel like I could talk for hours and hours and hours about birds, and you guys would be very hungry and need to go to the bathroom. So we're just going to narrow it down to a few. But general idea, the Bullock's and the hooded have very similar characteristics. Um, they're about the same size bird. They have this lovely beak that is for fruit, but also for nectar. So you can see that it's long and kind of pointed. Um, it has a very long tail. Um, it took me a little while to figure out why it was called a hooded, I'm embarrassed to say this, but it took me a while to figure out why it was called the hooded Oriole. I was like, it doesn't have a cap. How is, that, how is that a hood? And then someone's like, you know when you put a hoodie and you sprint it up and then it's just your face? I was like, ah. It's a yellow jacket, and it's, his face is black. So you can see, here's his hood. Cinched it up. It took me too long to figure that one out. Um, so these guys, um, the females are very drab. They're more olive. 
And um, they build these beautiful nests. They are woven, kind of hanging nests. Um, they tend to like, historically, they would um, come through and they would nest in sycamores and cottonwoods, um, walnuts, big taller, kind of along riparian areas too. But now they really like palm trees. And so if you have a palm tree, you'll often see them, they'll actually be pulling some of the strings, the fan palms, pulling the fibers off of the fan palms, and then they use that to weave their nests. The ones in my neighborhood really like the Brazilian peppers. They're always in the Brazilian peppers. And so it's always fun every year. I can see them I, from my, my um, living room. I can see a huge Brazilian pepper. And I just watch them, and it's very fun to do that. Um, so they eat berries. Uh, sometimes how you bring them into your garden. Obviously, berries, they really love grapes. They love um, like juicy things, really nectary, juicy things. I have seen people cut oranges and put them out because they like that kind of nectar, that sweetness. Um, but since we're at Tree of Life and we're going to talk about native plants, I would say that you, you have a lot of other options to do. You have the elderberry, you have the um, wild grape, you have the wild um, blackberry, the rose as well, you have the little bit of, you know, the rose hips. So. Um, Go that route if you can. Um, so these are just uh, some, some trees and plants. We talked about the elderberry and the palm. You know, we do have a native palm. Most of the palms you see here are not native, but we do have a native Washingtonia. Cottonwoods, I, I think cottonwoods are one of their favorites. One, because it, it has kind of this open, the branch habit is really nice for them. It's, the, the sycamores tend to be more like lightning bolt shape, but this, the cottonwoods tend to be a little bit more open-y, and I think they like that. I haven't figured out exactly why the cottonwoods are one of their favorites, but historically that's one that they used to always go to. Um, and then our insect eaters. I'm the yellow rump warbler. I affectionately call these guys butter butts because they have this yellow patch right on their rump, as you can see right there. Um, they are migratory. They are one of the migratory birds that don't nest here. So they are just moving through. They're not going to build a nest. They're not going to have babies here. But they're going to utilize your garden, and they're going to love it. And they are, are very social as well, which is fun. And they usually have several of them bouncing around, so then you just see these yellow spots flying through your yard. Um, they are warblers. I talked a little bit earlier about how warblers fly around a, a shrub and they glean insects off. And gleaning is when they are picking, using this, their sharp little beak, and they're picking insects off, whether it's going to be um, an aphid or a scale or a ladybug or um, a lacewing. So they're, they're picking these insects off your plants. So you don't have to do it for you. They're doing it for you. They're great. Um, but they will also, because you can see their, their beak, they will also eat some fruit and some small fruits, very small fruits, and seeds. But they're really cute, little butter butts. Um, the other one is uh, the warbler, the yellow warbler. This one um, is probably the most prevalent warbler in California. There, there are probably about 30 different type of warblers that we'll get in here in California, but this is one that you see a lot of. They tend to be, I think that they're declining a little bit because they tend to be found along riparian areas or wet or moist areas. Um, but that being said, even though our wetlands and riparian areas are diminishing in the state, we are watering the heck out of our gardens. <laughs> so I guess there's a little flip side to that. Um, what's interesting about these birds too is that they are often a, the victim of the brown-headed cowbird. Are you guys familiar with that bird? This is a bird that will parasitize other birds' nests. They'll lay their eggs and be like, absentee parent, like, you take care of my kids, I'm out of here. And, um, and that's a big problem with a lot of our endangered, or, you know, least bells vario, which is an endangered bird. But this little guy has figured out a way to combat the brown-headed cowbird. They just build the nest right on top of the other nest and the eggs and smother the eggs. They figured out a tactic. Apparently it's working because we're seeing a lot of them. So. It's very interesting. I've never seen another bird that does that or heard another bird that does that, so it's kind of exciting. Um, these guys are 
you know, that bright yellow, that butter yellow, that sunshine, California yellow, that's really easy to see when they're bouncing around in a tree. Um, and then the males will have this kind of red streaking on their chest. That's always a good indication of what type of bird you have. Um, they tend to be more higher up. You, you won't see them on the ground very often. You'll see them high up in the trees, in the large shrubs, at the ends of them. You know, you don't usually see them deep inside a shrub. You'll see them right around the crown of it. So those are cute. We might see some of those out here too. Um, the black Phoebe. These guys are ubiquitous all over the area, and they're so cute. Um, it's a really terrible picture. You can't tell what that is. But that is the nest at my, in my house. I have a, um, a covered deck, and they have decided for the last five years to build this little mud nest. So these guys um, are insectivores. They eat um, all insects. Um, they have this little cap that you can kind of see. You see how it has a like, little triangular shape on its head? That's a good indication of what it is. Um, flycatchers in the flycatcher family. Um, the name flycatcher indicates a, it's, a, it's an insect eater too. Um, you will often find them where there's water. So like where they love, they love turf because it's irrigated three times a week for five minutes a day. And so there's always water and mud there and insects. So you'll often see them around turf areas. And um, we have them, we don't have turf, but um, they are, my neighbor does, and so they're always, they're always in our yard too. Um, they are quite acrobatic when they're catching their bugs. I don't know if you had a chance to see them, but they'll fly in and you'll see them do a little flip maneuver, you know, like the jet fighters, Pew! they grab it and they'll fly up to um, a wire or a branch and then they'll eat their insect. Um, they're really quite curious. Uh, I, I feel like flycatchers, the black Phoebe and the Sage Phoebe are probably more of the more inquisitive birds in my mind, because you can kind of walk up to them. They'll, they'll perch on a branch or something, and they'll just look at you like, where, what you doing? Where are you going? And, you, and you're doing something, what you doing? Where are you going? <laughs> you're just having this conversation with each other. Like, what are you going to do? Um, and they'll sit around and they'll, and they'll watch what you're doing, which is kind of fun. Um, they have uh, little sharp chirp calls. Um, and they, they tend to have their own territories and they stick around the same territory. So you'll have the same bird or family of birds stay in that same area. So you can kind of get to know them. I can't tell them apart. They all look very similar. But um, you'll have them generation after generation if they're real happy. Another insect eater is the Buick's wren. Uh, this is a... We, there's several types of wrens that we have here in Orange County. We have the Buick's wren, we have the house wren, um, we have the canyon wren, um, we have the cactus wren, which is a very special bird, if you guys don't know about that one. That one, when it's um, declining in species and because and its habitat is leaving. That one is fun because it kind of sounds like an old Chevy trying to turn over. Um, and this, the Buick's wren, it's a little bit more raspy. It's, it's not an old Chevy. It's, um, it's more of a buzz. Um, maybe, a, maybe a broken down electronic or e-bike or something. I, I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, but they, you can see that beak that they do like the insects. Um, so they will, they stay a little, t typically stay lower again on the branches and shrubs and trees. Um, the Buick's run has a white stripe above its eyebrow, and that's, that's how you can differentiate that one from the, let's say, the house wren, which doesn't have the white stripe, um, or the, the, I was gonna say, the, the canyon wren doesn't have that either. We don't have a ton of canyon wrens here, but we, there's some out in um, like Casper's area, um, and those are kind of more ready in color. Um, they have a really fun habit, is they flick their tail when you see them, so they'll, there are those birds when you, sometimes you'll see the, um, the silhouette and the tail is sticking straight up, like a dog that's looking for something. You know, it's like, hey. And so they, you can kind of see it in this photo, but not great. Um, but they, their tail and their flicking tail is a good indicator. So if you can't tell what it is, it's a little BB, little brown bird. But then you see this flicking of the tail, and then you see the tail go straight up. You're like, that's got, probably going to be a wren. Um, yeah. Forages for insects, usually down low, 10 feet. Uh, they are cavity. They like cavities as well. They like small areas in their nesting. Um, 
And then they, they are very vocal if you get too close to them. They, they have these warning calls, these buzzings. If you, they scold you, and you know that they're scolding. Like, ring, 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 ring. And you're like, okay, this is your territory. I'll back off. Um, but they're, they're really fun to watch. Um, bush tits, I think these are probably one of my favorites. I think I've said that already three times, right? Well, I have lots of favorites. <laughs> um, these guys are, are just, they're darling little nuggets. I mean, they're, they're so small. And they, there's never just one of them because they're family units. And it can be a flock of like 20 of them. And then they just all come in and they just chatter and they bounce around a bush and, they, and they're upside down. And, and um, they tend to have lighter eyes. So if you're trying to look through your binos and look for them, they have lighter eyes. Um, they are very petite. They're very plump. They have a long tail. Um, they, their nests look like dirty socks hanging in a tree. <laughs> That's the best way you can describe it. Uh, and, and they're just a delight. And they're great for, for cleaning a lot of aphids. They like a lot of aphids. They like scale, which is a bad thing on your plants. Uh, so really great to have in the garden. All right, um, the black-headed grosbeak. This is also a great bird. Um, it's just so fun. It has this, it's really pretty. It's, it has this cinnamon colored chest, this black and white back on its head, black head, um, some white banding on its wings. Um, it's an insect eater, but it also eats fruits. It's kind of a generalist. It will eat fruit, it will eat nuts. Um, the females, as you can see, are, are not so showy. They, um, they don't have a distinct black. They're more brown. So this is a western bluebird. I'm pretty sure we have a few here. There's usually a few um, out in the Casa area. This is a bird that is so iconic. It, it's just it's a beautiful bird, the bluebird of happiness. Um, it's just a really beautiful bird and fun and a lot of people are making efforts to encourage more of them into our neighborhoods by putting bird boxes in. Have you seen them hanging from trees? trees? Um, and they'll utilize them, which is great. So uh, um, ash throw to fly catchers, bees. I mean, a lot of things will use them. But it's neat that, that there is such an effort to expand their populations. And they are an insect eater, as you can tell. There's a picture of one eating an insect right there. Um, they are cavity nesters. So, you know, as I kind of referenced earlier, people tend to get rid of dead and dying trees, which is where a lot of cavities are. So I think that's why there's such a push to put these bird boxes out on trees that are doing well um, to encourage and have a place for these birds to, to nest. Um, just really, they're just fun to see. This bright blue, you know, bird is just so fun. Um, so nectar eaters. Really, I'm just going to talk mostly about our hummingbirds. Uh, in Orange County, we have three types of hummingbirds. We have the Annas, the Costas, and the Allens. And um, they're all very quite small. You see a hummingbird. You know, oh, I have, a, I have a hummingbird shirt. This Tree of Life shirt, guys. Mike Evans drew this many, many moons ago. And I've had this. I got the new rendition of it. And I've had this shirt for years and years. So yeah, and so this is an epilobium, actually. But hummingbird. This, the redhead, that's an Anna's. So Anna's, um, well, we'll go into Anna's. But they, you will find them, and they have, are great hoverers. They will stay in one spot drinking nectar for a long time. Um, the males are the ones who are mostly the most colorful ones. The females, as in most birds, tend to be quite dull. Um, these are the three types. So the Anna's has the red um, magenta kind of head cap and green body, um, or brown, green brown. And then the Kosas is beautiful. As it's purple, and they kind of have like lamb chops that come down, as opposed to um, the Annas that will kind of cuts off. You know, it's, it's just the cap. But the, the Kosas has these lamb chops that come down on either side. So that's a good way to, to identify them. And they tend to, the Kosas also tend to be in more deserty, drier areas. And then the Allens. Um, is almost looks like a, a female Anna's, but it has a, a little bit more red and, it, and it has a little bit more cinnamon color to them. The Allens tend to be a little bit more aggressive. 
Um, once you get an Allens in your neighborhood um, or in your bird feeder, he's claimed that area and he's not going to let anybody else in there. They're quite aggressive. Um, not in a bad way, but they, they, he just wants his area. So you can get several Allens in there. There's been talk about how Anna's, the Allens are kind of pushing the Annas out because Annas tend to be a little bit more docile. In that sense, they're not going to dive bomb you as much. They're not, um, they're not going to have sword fights in the air. That's, that's, that's kind of like what these Allens will do. They dip and zag all over. Um, Allens are really neat too is that you can, sometimes you can hear them when they do this, when they're breeding, the males will fly really up high, up high, like a zzz, and then they do a, like a J or a circle down and they fly down. So they just this really, it's almost, to me it's more of an oval, but people say it's a J, and they'll fly 20, 30 feet up in the air, and then they'll zip down, and it's kind of a breeding behavior. Um, so that's one way you can identify them as well. Um, Really, just great little birds to have. Um, there's, I don't know, is the um, is the Costa still over the grape? Over, same one. Oh, that's so neat. When I worked here, um, you know, six years ago now, and um, there is always this Costas that would right by the the shed, which now is open a little bit more, and and he would hang out in the grape, and he'd always be there. I think I might even have a photo of him in here. So, um, hummingbird plants. You know, sages, monkey flower, and oh, it got shifted over a little bit. Sorry about that. Penstemons, woolly blue curls, um, the epilobium, California fuchsia, right here. Um, thing, flowers that have a long neck, long tubular neck. That's because they have that long beak that they want to get into. Um, Tacoma, I think there might be some Tacomas in the, um, the nursery as well, which are a little bit more southwestern. But um, they. They like they're not going to go for flowers that have like a like a sunflower that have a flat face. They want something with a long neck so they can put their beak in and, and drink the nectar out of. All right, so we've talked about birds, talked a lot about birds. <laughs> now we're going to talk about plants. Um, so large large shrubs. We kind of went over a little bit, but just just to hone in, hammer home like these great plants that are available here at Tree of Life. Uh, Toyon, heteromeles, it's an evergreen shrub tree, it's a shrubby tree, because you can limb it up and have it be a very small, almost patio tree, which is quite nice. Um, so it has these beautiful red berries that come right around fall, right around Thanksgiving, um, and they last for a really long time and a lot of birds enjoy those berries. Um, the black-headed grosbeak, the ones in my, the Toyon in my yard, I've last, black-headed grosbeak, um, mockingbirds, and this is only, and I live in downtown San Clemente, and it's, they come through, um, so they, they do enjoy that one. Um, elderberry, uh, we can eat elderberry, it's quite delicious, you want to eat them on the ripe when they're like that really cool, cool blue color. Um, these are deciduous, uh, but great because they are super dense, and so you will often find um, nests after come fall and the leaves start coming down, then you're like, oh my gosh, there was a nest in there. I had no idea, because they're so dense. There's a beautiful specimen. If you guys get a chance to like poke your head down this, um, this road right over here on the right-hand side, there's a beautiful specimen that's, I don't know, 30 feet tall. Is it still doing good? Oh, it's, it's just gorgeous. And it's huge, and I, you don't tend to see them that big, but this is a nursery and it's well-loved, and so it's, it's just exploding. But um, really a, a, a great plant um, just because it's so dense for cover, has the fruit, we can eat the fruit, um, and it, it's just, it's really quite nice. And the flowers, to me, the flowers when they're blooming kind of look like clouds. They just they're these puffy little white flowers. Um, lemonade berry, you know, I think, oh, so I've been standing in front of these guys. Here's this, um, this is the elderberry right here, Sambucus. Oh, look, it's got bird poop on it, too. <laughs> Someone's been utilizing it. Also known as whitewash. Whitewash is the technical term for bird poop. It's not. I just made that up. Um, here's the toy on right here, too. So we have some toy on. Um, when I'm done, feel free to come. You guys are welcome to come look over here at some of these great specimens. Um, and there's oak. OK, good. Got them. They were there. Um, so lemonade berry and sugar bush. So lemonade berry tends to be more local 
to the coast on, on Cal an Orange County area, we tend to have more lemonade berry. As soon as you get over the hill, Temecula, you guys have the sugar bush. It's this weird kind of break. You sometimes, you know, around, I think like around um, Anaheim Hills area, you'll have both, because that's kind of where the mountains kind of converge. But in this area, coastal, you'll have mostly just lemonade berry. Um, the berries are very tart. That's why they're called lemonade berry. <laughs> I've eaten them. You can eat them in a pinch. But they're, um, and birds eat them and, and enjoy them quite thoroughly. Um, coyote bush and mule fat, these are our baccarat species. These are, again, like dense shrubs, um, really great for um, cover. For, um, for a lot of the birds, especially the coyote bush. The um, mule fat is a favorite nesting for the endangered least bells vireo. Um, and then Roger's red grape um, is just fantastic in so many ways because it is quite dense. And when the canopy goes, it's a prolific grower. It can grow 15, 20 feet in a year, cut it back. Um, it's, it's really dense and great for, for a number of birds. Okay, medium to small shrub for nesting, cover, and food. We're on the home, home stretch. Um, I think I've talked a lot about the bush sunflower. It, it's just this time of year, it's blooming, it's great. Um, fun fact for you guys, this is not related to birds, but just because I can. Um, so this is the bush sunflower. If you take and scratch, oh, I want one but black. So you will look for the black part, and if you scratch it, scratch and sniff, and you smell it, it smells like raspberry chocolate. Super fun fact. <laughs> now everybody's going to be scratching out your plants. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but when you plant them in your yard, you can amaze and astound your friends with that fun fact. Um, so one thing about um, the bush sunflower, the Ancelia, Ancelia is its botanical name, is it is summer dormant. So don't freak out if it starts losing its leaves in the summer. That's how it's adapted to our climate when we don't have any rain in the summer. It's putting all its energy in the springtime to, to produce these beautiful green, lush leaves and prolific flowers for all the finches that want to eat them. And um, so it will die back a little bit in summer. It's not, it will go dormant. It, won't die. it will die back in the sense that it will lose its leaves. It won't die. Um, but it may look like it in some sense. You can water it over the summer a little bit to keep some of that greenery. Uh, watering in the summer can be a little tricky because summertime is when you're supposed to be sitting back and enjoying your garden, right? And not working too hard. It's too hot. Uh, so you just let it, you let it take a nap. It's taking a little siesta. So um, there are two types of Encelias, we have the California, Encelia californica, which is um, local to Orange County, coastal. Encelia farinosa is for you guys out in Temecula area. Um, that has the gray foliage, um, that's it down here. Kind of more um, heat and, and frost tolerant than the Encelia californica, which is more coastal. And salvia. Sage Landia, there's so, there's so many great sages. Um, I think there's like, an, you know, there's books and books on sages, but they are wonderful, prolific bloomers. And not only are they great for birds, but they're, they're great for butterflies. They're great for, um, for bees. Native bees love them. They're really fantastic. They, there's a number of varieties here at Tree of Life. Um, Salvia clevelandii, the Cleveland sage, is one that typically there's a lot of varieties. There's aromas, there's hapatul, there's, there's um, Winifred Gilman. Yes, I mean, the list goes on and on. So it's, it's just, and that's the one that you see over here, you know, really prolific flowers, beautiful purple colors, um, great, great plant. The one that you will see occurring most naturally in our native slopes around here would be the black sage, which is the one on the left-hand side over here. Um, you know, kind of white, white, maybe lilac white flowers, um, but hardy, hardy plants. I mean, you could plant them, get them three years, and leave them alone, and they'll do their thing. You just deadhead them every once in a while if you need to, or you leave them on and let the birds eat the seeds. 
mean, look at that. It's like making your maintenance so much easier because the birds will take care of it. Um, the picture in the middle is the electric sage. That's real fun, bright blue electric. Um, most of these tend to go summer dormant, so they're not going to be as prolific. They're not going to have a ton of flowers. They're not going to have a ton of leaves in the summer. And that's, again, their way of, of dealing with our hot, dry summers. I mean, this year, my fingers are crossed that we're going to get some more rain. Um, and we might get a few more, but it's been a very, very, very dry year. I think we're at six inches when we're typically at nine. So um, they have a long, dry summer ahead. So they're going to probably lose their leaves, which is fine, because they're saving that energy for the next spring. Um, and oh, Dakota. Um, so one bird that we didn't talk about here, because we didn't have a whole lot of time, but the quail. Quail love these, the seeds of this, uh, the sages. And if you get a chance, there's typically a, I hope there's still there, a little covey of quail. And they usually are over um, across from the retail area and the kind of by the uh, sycamores and oaks. They tend to have some quails over there. So if you get a chance, hopefully we'll see some birds. We can go walk around and see what we can find. Um, buckwheat, this is such the workhorse of plants. It's, I also think it's very underutilized. Um, I think more and more people are starting to see the beauty of it because it is just, it's probably, besides oaks, it's probably like one of the best insect pollinator plants too. Our native bees love the buckwheats. Our um, butterflies love the buckwheats. Birds love the buckwheats. Elisa loves the buckwheats. I mean, it's, they're really great. And there's so many different types of buckwheats, too. We tend to have um, the, um, sorry, I just saw a bird. Uh, bird, squirrel, bird. Um, the buckwheat that you tend to see out here mostly is the fasciculatum. And that's a great one. But there, the, there, there's this guy right here which is the Conejo buckwheat. Um, I think I called it the, I called it the um, sulfur last time, but it's Conejo, I apologize for that. Um, then there's the island buckwheat, um, which I don't see out here, but which is a really kind of lower, smaller buckwheat. That's this guy in the middle, oh, this guy is the island buckwheat. Um, just so many different varieties of buckwheats. There's low growing, there's taller, there's giant buckwheat. I have a giant buckwheat in my yard. <laughs> And it's giant, and I love it so much. And so and I keep cutting it back, and it's just, it's so happy. And the birds love it, and I love it. It's, they're just, and, it, and it's what's great is a lot of the, um, they have this humble kind of shape, as you can see right here. These guys always remind me of constellations for some reason, the way that they're lined up. Like, um, but it's kind of an humble, so it's a great landing pad for a lot of insects as well. Um, so just, you know, just fantastic. Um, and then plants that have insects. All of them. All of them, have, all of them have insects. This is the catalog for Tree of Life. Every single one of these plants is going to have an insect on it. So um, you're good to go with that. Um, so since I have you as my captive audience, I'm going to talk a little bit about nesting birds and, um, and just things to be aware of. Um, there is a thing called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It's actually a federal law, and it prohibits people to take nests. Um, so when you are doing some maintenance around your yard, if you're cutting trees, um, please be aware that nesting season for most birds is typically between March 15th and September 15th. That's when they're most actively breeding and nesting. Raptors tend to nest a lot earlier. They'll start nesting sometimes in January, um, sometimes even in in December. Hummingbirds tend to nest almost year round. But so just keep that in mind that when you are pruning for the next generation of birds and the next generation of birders, <laughs> that we can that there are gonna be um, something to see. So just keep that in mind. As you can see, there's um, a hummingbird that blends in. Like you can barely tell on that photo because it's kind of blown up, but that's a little hummingbird sitting in a little, little tiny nest. So um, do your part to um, be careful and wise when you are pruning and cutting your trees for, um, for the nesting birds. Um, and then some great birding resources. I put some great books that are offered at La Casa, um, which is the retail area up in front. And um, these are also some of my other favorite birds. 
I use those Western birds a lot, and I, um, that's usually in my backpack when I'm hiking around. Um, but these are all wonderful. The Birds of California has great um, photos, big photos. So really great resources. There's also some other really great online sources um, all about birds. A lot of this information was from um, all about birds for the details. Hi, Dakota. Hi, buddy. Um, so a really great resource is that. I, I just came across a new web, and you can get it on your phone, too, so they have an app. Um, so I'm going to look on my phone right now. Uh, there is the All About Birds app, which um, is very cool. And so if you're, you're hiking or you're doing something and you don't happen to have your book on you, um, you can use your app to kind of find it. And it's um, Merlin ID, which is that guy over there on the left. And you can explore the birds and you say, oh, it was like a perching bird. And so it will help you walk through that. And then just recently, one of my resource specialists at OC Parks led me to an app called BirdNet. I don't know, are, is anybody familiar with BirdNet? Isn't it so fun? <gasps> Highly recommend that one, super fun. Um, and then some great California native plant resource books. Um, the Bibles. These are all available at the Casa Two. Um, I think I used to keep one or two of these by my bedside table for a little while, just when I wanted to read up on, on, on plants. Um, so these are great if you want to plan and add more plants to your native garden. Um, great resources. I, I think I only did a drop in the bucket of the birds and the plants that are available because there's so much out there. And um, I want to be cognizant of your time because if people have binos and they want to go walk around, I'm going to go walk around for a little bit too. So um, with that, thank you very much. Get your binos. And, um, and that's my little daughter, my, the future birder. Um, so that's it. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask. If not, we can get some go walk around a little bit, but thank you for the time. I hope you guys got some good information and